thank you for having me, uh, and uh, I'm very, very uh, uh, keen to, to learn more about the initiative and what, uh, what it's about and to, to participate. So th thanks again for having me here. Uh, as, as Alex mentioned, I, we did a study uh, for uh, Shell at the time on the offset potential within BC to uh, really to meet BC's climate objectives and in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, and obviously to contribute to low cost mitigation in the province um, in, in general. And a lot of what I'm gonna say uh, today really stems from that analysis because I think it's highly relevant in terms of where we can achieve greenhouse gas reductions on the project, where we can use carbon markets to, uh, and leverage those carbon markets to uh, provide value for greenhouse gas reductions. So just very quickly about who Blue Source is, if you, if you don't know us. Uh, so we're uh, an offset developer, uh, and we've been around for just under 20 years. Uh, we are all over North America. Uh, we are uh, certainly the, the largest uh, offset developer in North America in terms of just the sheer amount of projects we've done over our history, uh, with over 200 projects, uh, over 20 different project types. Uh, over 150 million tons of emissions reductions that we've been involved in. And uh, we're involved from the very beginning in helping proponents through the whole technical process in developing the carbon offset through to marketing and monetizing that offset in the markets using our commercial network. And a major focus of what we do uh, with, I think it's nine professional foresters on staff is forest carbon, uh, avoided grasslands, these sort of nature-based solutions, which I think are so relevant to, uh, to BC. Okay, on to the interesting stuff. I do want to, I, I'd like for everybody here to, and, and on the phone, to take two things from this presentation if you forget everything else. The first would be that we have a major challenge uh, with respect to achieving our climate ambitions and our greenhouse gas reduction targets as part of that. And that challenge uh, can be met in many ways, but the, the higher the cost of reducing emissions, the more difficult that challenge is going to be, the less we can actually reduce. And offsets are a key component to actually keeping the cost of, of, of GHG reductions uh, moderate and therefore, um, therefore uh, allowing us to hit our, uh, our climate objectives in the province and as a nation um, in a, in a cost-effective way. And, we'll see, and, the, and the numbers really bear that out. The second thing I'd like uh, to, for, for you to take away from this is the nature-based solutions, the, the potential for our grasslands, our forests, our wetlands, our peatlands here in Canada, and, and certainly in particular in BC, uh, offers a, a very significant potential for that GHG mitigation in a way that creates absolutely massive benefits to our biodiversity, our ecosystems, our watersheds. Okay. Great, so uh, hopefully we come away with those, those two things and I can uh, make a compelling argument as to, uh, as to why that's the case. And this, this slide really says a lot. So the offset demand potential, again, these are numbers that are high level estimates. There is a lot of uncertainty in any given one of these numbers. So please don't take this to the bank as the sort of authority of this is the number, uh, but it is very indicative of, uh, of I think, the, the reality of demand and supply in BC. So we've estimated uh, using a, uh, an assumption that you would have a 20% of the compliance uh, for greenhouse gas amongst, uh, greenhouse gas reductions amongst industry to hit sort of a clean BC plan. Uh, if 20% if of that of that required reduction is met through offsets to 2025, you'd have 4 million tons of 
uh, of demand for greenhouse gas reductions within the province. And as you extend that out to 2020, sorry, to 2030 and 2035, and you assume that you're going to have to rely on offsets to a greater extent, you're going to exhaust those, those uh, mitigation opportunities in industry, which tend to uh, have a very high marginal cost, and you're going to need to go to the nature-based solutions and to, and to offsets. So at a 40 and a 60% rate of usage of offsets, you get into 8 million tons and 12 million tons per year of demand for, uh, for offsets, for greenhouse gas reductions in those non-industrial sectors. So uh, that is considerable uh, when you consider uh, a you know, 64 and a half, 65 million ton uh, greenhouse gas footprint for the province. The, those are very material numbers. What is the, what is the, the supply? Uh, well, certainly the supply part of the equation, I, th I think, has a lot greater uncertainty. Uh, we have very good, I wouldn't call them guidelines, we have them sort of handrails that tell us what we need to reduce through our Paris Agreement targets and through our, our, uh, the, the goals set by the province. In terms of supply, uh, we've looked at many of these different uh, reduction uh, well, GHG reduction um, potential categories, and we've looked, and we sort of looked at what has high potential in terms of its application to BC, and is market accepted. There is an acceptance by regulators by the market on how to quantify these emissions reductions. Um, that that's a big factor in terms of enabling that supply, and then we go on to less probable categories of emissions reductions because they either don't have the same potential here in BC or they're not as market tested as, as the other ones. But the general conclusion of this, and, and we're going we're gonna to break this down a little bit further, but the general conclusion in terms of supply is we have a potential supply of between 4.7 and 5.5 million tons per year in 2025 through offsets. Uh, a large part through market-tested um, greenhouse gas uh, te sorry, technologies and, and methodologies that are applicable to the province. As you extend that to 2030 and 2035, that really does increase in a significant way. You can imagine based on Rob's uh, explanation earlier when you look at direct air capture, something of that sort, you don't flip the switch on one of those facilities in a day, uh, nor do you do it in four years. These are, these are projects that take a long time, and so it's going to take to 2030 to 2035 for a lot of those larger opportunities to come on stream. But we get up to the 23, 28 million tons per year of offset potential, which is almost half of uh, BC's greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and, and that, that really is um, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting potential that we really need to, to capture. Are we talking just about nature-based? No, here? no, we're talking about all types of greenhouse gas reductions, carbon capture and storage, uh, energy efficiency, uh, methane capture in upstream oil and gas. We're going to go into uh, all okay. of these, but it's everything. Yes. Okay. And what's the price range in terms of the cost? Get it? We're going to get into it, and this is not uh, this is not factoring in what is cost effective at the current pricing. It is the total potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So the balance of this is, uh, you know, what does it tell us? It tells us that the potential exists for domestic offsets in BC to supply a, a and a very significant part of the compliance obligation for BC industry uh, to meet BC's provincial uh, goals and to export emissions reductions to other provinces and potentially internationally through mechanisms like the, 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 the international aviation sector uh, offset mechanisms. So it is not only a potential for uh, 
really lowering the cost of, of BC meeting its own objectives, but also generating economic opportunities and economic growth through the export of greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, and this keeps uh, this investment and it keeps the co-benefits, particularly related to nature-based solutions in the province. So a, a, just a, a very large opportunity that uh, I think is, is, is one that does not exist in, in every province, it's certainly not in every country. So it's, it's definitely a competitive advantage uh, and is, is the way I see it for, for BC. So we, we just talked very high level about the opportunity, what's the demand, what's the supply. What, what considerations uh, do we need to look at to determine how, how viable that actually is? Unknown participant is now exiting. What's, what's going to be important to, uh, to advocate for to ensure that uh, is, uh, is happening in order to actually capitalize on that opportunity? Well, um, we need to see a change in policy. Um, certainly, the Clean BC plan and the provisions for performance, greenhouse gas performance standards on industry, uh, including LNG, uh, do not contemplate the use of offsets currently. And that is uh, a, a policy decision uh, at this stage in time. But I think if you go back and you look at uh, the need to reduce and four, eight, 12 million tons of potential offset demand, if that doesn't come from offsets, it has to come from somewhere else. Meaning it would have to be reduced internally by BC industry at whatever the cost. And that, that uh, is a, a very serious concern. Whatever the cost is not uh, an acceptable climate policy. We need to be going after the lowest cost reductions. And that speaks to that, that one very important point I wanted to make. So we need a, we need a, a, a change of, of heart in the acceptance of offsets as a, an integral part of uh, the Clean BC and our plans to, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in industry. Acceptance of BC offsets in the federal uh, carbon pricing plan and in other provincial offset systems and in the international aviation sector system, which is called Corsia. So the supply and demand balance by BC, if it's only BC and offsets can neither come into the province nor go out is one thing. Uh, the potential uh, for offsets is greatly uh, increase to the extent that uh, BC is able to, or the system here is able to um, trade uh, with other jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of demand and certainly in many ways less potential uh, in, in other provinces. And so the, that export opportunity really depends and therefore pricing really depends on uh, on uh, how the system in BC speaks to these other provincial and federal systems. <coughs> the timing and the resource required to approve the protocols that are required to quantify and generate and register eligible offsets. A very big question mark. It takes a lot of, of uh, work on behalf of the regulator to develop these protocols uh, and the extent to which uh, this potential exists and at what time really depends on, on when we have these protocols uh, in, in place. And finally, complementary policies. Uh, and the big one is what Rob referred to it as the low carbon fuel standard. You know, right now uh, we have uh, in the Canadian framework, we have carbon pricing at $30 a ton in other jurisdictions in right now and going up to $50 a ton. And we're operating uh, in, in, in provinces and federally in that sort of price range for greenhouse gas reductions and offsets. But in the BC low carbon fuel standard, uh, entities are paying $185 a ton for greenhouse gas reductions. That is applicable to the transportation sector, uh, but 
um, and it's sort of the provision of low carbon fuels to the transportation sector. But the emissions reductions, particularly with respect to carbon capture and storage, and Rob alluded to this, they're not going to happen at $50 a ton. But they may very well happen at $185 a ton. So that's a big uh, factor in terms of the, uh, the, the potential for uh, technologies like carbon capture and storage, but there, there are certainly others as well. This is, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on this, but it does give you a picture of what greenhouse gas reduction technologies have we, have we d really deployed through offsets historically in the province. And you'll see uh, there's a great deal of uh, forest carbon, sort of improved forest management, <laughs> forest conservation uh, that plays into this. Um, but there are also other project categories that we've developed, energy efficiency, engine fuel management, instrument gas to air, um, electrification of, uh, of gas uh, fields that were consuming uh, natural gas. So that there certainly is a, uh, I think it speaks to some of the diversity of greenhouse gas reduction um, opportunities that are in the province. So I, I, I did speak about how offset protocols and their availability is a major factor in delivering in this potential. Well, the BC, uh, the BC Climate uh, Branch has published their priorities for offset protocol development. So this will, this will give us clues as to what, what opportunities are going to be uh, emerging um, in 2025 and in 2030 and a 2035 horizon. Uh, their highest priority, which they completed last year, was a fuel switching protocol. And then the next priority protocols are pneumatics venting. So this is reducing methane venting in upstream oil and gas. Uh, Forestry is a major one. Anaerobic uh, digestion of wastewater and of uh, on-farm uh, manure. Organic waste diversion, landfill gas, and low carbon cement. Right. So we can expect to see uh, protocol development on these over the years to come. Uh, forest carbon is one that is underway right now. Uh, and, and I think we can expect to be one of the next protocols uh, this year. Low priority, uh, but still on the list are uh, low tillage systems for agriculture, for row crop agriculture, recovery and destruction of ozone depleting substances, coastal tidal wetland restoration and creation, and carbon capture and utilization. You know, one thing to mention here is this certainly does not appear to be a list that's prioritized according to mitigation potential. This is a list that um, I, I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you what the criteria is for this prioritization. I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't and, and there isn't a lot of thought put into it, but with the evolution of technology like direct air capture, with the opportunity related to carbon capture and utilization, we, we're going to want to review uh, this and, and see what has the greatest potential and, and really go after what's, what's, uh, what has you know, the greatest bang for our buck. Fuel switching is a, is a great opportunity and, and there's no reason to, to, to believe it. It shouldn't be right at the top of the list. Uh, but should carbon capture and utilization be at the very bottom? Maybe three years ago, uh, but now? Uh, those are the things we just need to, be, to, to revisit. So, uh, Let's dig a little deeper into that offset supply. Um, and again, let's consider these numbers, sort of high level numbers that give us an indication. There, there is a great deal of uncertainty in estimating the actual potential for this. But uh, one, I think, very relevant technology is conversion of diesel power generation to renewables, to wind, solar, uh, to biomass uh, in remote communities. So uh, a major application to remote First Nations communities. So we've estimated between 46,000 tons in 2025 uh, up to about 100,000 tons of CO2 per year in 2035 of potential. And you can very easily identify how many diesel generation facilities are there uh, and, and make reasonable assumptions about 
uh, what could be converted. So that's one with a, perhaps a little better certainty. Fuel switching from gas to renewables and running compressors in upstream oil and gas. This is a pretty large opportunity uh, and one that uh, just enhances the efficiency of our, of our, natural, of our gas extraction. So 800,000 tons of potential to 2025. This is per year uh, to, uh, to 1.8 million tons per year in 2035 of potential. The next one is a really important one, uh, and it's reduction of methane venting from pneumatics devices. These are, these are devices that control pressure of gas systems in upstream oil and gas, and they just vent methane in order to... And, and this is a, just a, a wonderful uh, example of, of what you can do using offsets. We have a, a very large program in Alberta <coughs> where uh, there are regulations that we're going to, in 2023, we're going to be required to uh, no longer vent these. Well, we've installed over 9,000 really highly efficient controllers that reduce the venting of this into these facilities in Alberta for free. And we've given them checks and we've paid for these systems on the basis of the greenhouse gas reductions that we've monetized and offsets in the Alberta system. So we've allowed gas producers in Alberta, which are, they're in a bind right now. They are uh, facing very difficult market circumstances due to the price of natural gas. And we've basically avoided very large capital costs for them in complying with this rule in 2023 by installing controllers uh, for them for free uh, on the basis of the greenhouse gas value. Those are the things we want to be doing. Um, and, and it has a very similar application here in BC. Okay, improved forest management. This is, the, uh, this is a big one. There are uh, many types of improved forest management, whether it's uh, you know, taking logged uh, forest and protecting them, whether it's reduced impact logging, extension of rotation ages. We're not going to get into all the details, but suffice to say there is an opportunity on private lands, private forested lands, in the order of um, a million tons in 2025 to two million tons per year in 2035. And on crown land and traditional territory, uh, there is a very significant potential of 2.2 million tons to 2025, 16.5 million tons in 2035. Now this makes very high level assumptions around you know, what portion of uh, traditional territories uh, in uh, forest licenses do we undertake projects such as the Great Bear Project and, and, and others where we're providing protections and we're, uh, we are that, that sequester more CO2 in those forests. Um, and, uh, and so this this, this has a wide variance to it, but uh, it is also uh, certainly the largest um, mitigation potential that we have, not only in BC, but, but across the country. Yeah. Well, this, this program, it, it, it will be about the protocol, but the forest carbon uh, protocol is going to incentivize actions taken at a project level, you know, for a given tree farm license, let's say. Uh, for that license holder to go beyond the regulated standard uh, and to get credit for going beyond it. Um, it's not going to be a more programmatic approach where, you know, the regulations themselves, uh, you know, aspire to a higher standard of sustainable forest management and you quantify the difference. Uh, those types of, those types of programmatic um, regulation level Things do exist in different types of offset categories. It's not to say it can't be done, but that's not the way it's envisaged here. Yeah, okay. This can be taking logged sure. to protected yeah. and doing conservation set-asides. This can be extending the rotation ages uh, of harvesting. It can be reduced impact logging. Uh, it can be a and whole number of things. But you're saying you have to have a protocol we did. to capture that. Yeah. Or if you're, then I also heard was, if you're planning to do it already, then it's not subject to a protocol. That is the case for every offset. That criteria, what's called additionality, is you have to go beyond common practice where the regulated standard exists in forest carbon the same way it does for every other offset category. 
They're using offsets to try and incentivize uh, incremental action above and beyond business as usual or common practice. And that's, that's a universally accepted approach in, in offsets. OK. Um, what? Yes. While you're going through all of those processes, um, what kind of impact that they like, um, see that British Columbia went through a really and other, everywhere, everywhere in Canada when we had that um, heat stuff climate. And there's forests burning all over the place. <coughs> how do you measure that? How, how is it measured? So um, it, it is very much measured. So Canada does an inventory of land use, land use change and forests. And so uh, we report nationally and provincially the carbon that is released into the atmosphere from natural events like pests and forest fires on a, on a, on a very large scale. Um, uh, and this is done through uh, forest modeling by the Canadian Forestry Service and by provincial uh, counterparts. So it is accounted for as a greenhouse gas. How do you deal with that in the context of a, of a forest carbon offset project is a very other, different question. And that is, um, every project, so we have over 50 forest carbon projects that we've developed. And every single one of those, when we quantify the emissions sequestered, we take a, par a portion of those, and those have to go into an insurance pool. And every project contributes uh, reductions into that insurance pool so that when there is a fire or a pest or a natural disturbance that causes the release, it gets compensated out of that insurance pool so that it doesn't impact the actual license holder or landowner. And that's the way we deal uh, in carbon offset markets uh, with these natural disturbances. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Carbon capture and storage. Uh, Rob spoke uh, in more detail about this. Well, I won't linger on it, but uh, you know, you've got uh, to a half million ton per year potential to 20. Um, 2025, um, sorry, in 2030, uh, but a significantly higher cost uh, than the BC carbon tax. And so that's one that would depend on a, for example, a low carbon fuel standard accepting carbon capture and storage. An interesting aspect here is uh, we have a clean fuel standard under development federally they are working on a protocol to recognize carbon capture and storage uh, and enhanced oil recovery. Uh, so you could, uh, you could very much see um, a protocol that does recognize that in BC if there's alignment in, in the programs. And, uh, and so that's, that's one to really watch out for. Carbon capture, uh, capture from other industrial sources Again, uh, very high cost, but where, where the real potential lies due to the concentration of CO2 uh, and the, the, the cost of capture in large part is in enhanced oil recovery and in, uh, in pulp mills. Destruction of ozone depleting substances. And there's a larger category here of high global warming uh, refrigerants uh, that are used ubiquitously uh, in large refrigeration systems that can be backed out for, for low lowering uh, refrigerants. And then uh, those systems leak, uh, and that's what gets vented to the atmosphere. But we can recover uh, those refrigerants and we can destroy them. And these are extremely high global warming potential refrigerants in many cases, the, you know, 1,550 times the global warming potential of CO2. So that has about a million um, tons of, uh, sorry, uh, 77,000 tons uh, in 2025, but going up to about a million eight in 2035. And then finally, direct air capture. You know, we really assumed we have one sort of carbon engineering plant in Squamish, let's say, uh, by, 20, uh, by 2030, uh, and that reduces a million tons. But multiply that by three if you had three plants. Okay, and uh, there are certainly other categories that we have not gone through here. Uh, we looked at many different uh, options and we looked very specifically at 
carbon capture applications to different uh, industry sectors and, and utilization. Um, but in the interest of time, we were really looking at the sort of larger and more applicable um, offset categories. I do want to uh, speak a little bit about uh, natural climate solutions uh, more specifically. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Cornelia to, uh, to sort of weigh in here as well with their, uh, their considerable experience in this in, in BC. The, uh, you basically have three categories of natural climate solutions. And not all of these are, are offset <coughs> opportunities. Uh, many of them are going to be addressed through other forms of carbon finance, whether they be green bonds, whether they be direct incentives from governments. Um, but many do have a, an, an application through offsets. Improved forest management, which we spoke of, is, is really the, uh, the largest opportunity given our forest resources. Um, but we also have avoided conversion of forests. Uh, and this is an important one. In many parts of the country, we're facing very, very significant loss of our forests to row crop agriculture, uh, to, curiously enough, I, I travel the country talking to forest owners and hemp is a major uh, threat to uh, forests in terms of the uh, uh, communities looking at hemp production and clearing forests for that. Um, as a result of the new market. Um, but we have uh, avoided conversion of grasslands. Native grasslands are the most threatened uh, ecosystem in the world. Uh, and that is uh, certainly the case in Canada. Uh, so there is a, uh, there's a lot of work and this, this will be a protocol that will be available federally to generate offsets from avoiding the conversion of grasslands to row crop agriculture. Um, and we have less accepted, but we still have other methodologies to calculate and, and generate voluntary offsets from avoided conversion of, of uh, peat swamp forest um, and of wetlands. The second main category of natural climate solutions would be restoration. Okay? And afforestation, reforestation is, is a big, um, a big mitigation potential, but it's one that's not very, not easily addressed through an offset market because you have a major upfront cost in seedlings, but you're not sequestering much carbon until years, and it depends on your species, years 15, 20, 25, 30. So you have front end loaded costs, back end loaded revenues. And this is where, uh, incentive programs and BC has uh, I think a, a successful um, forest carbon incentive that addresses reforestation um, and we clearly have federally a uh, this is a big component of the uh, the federal climate uh, action around planting three billion trees it is um, a major one that I think with application here to BC is coastal and tidal wetland creation and restoration um, uh, we also have peatlands restoration, grasslands forage restoration. Uh, all of these are, are ecosystems that exist uh, in, in Canada, some to a, a greater extent in, in BC that, that combines the ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and generate revenues that enable these projects, but also aligns very well with provincial federal uh, conservation objectives as well. The last one would be climate smart agriculture uh, and land management. So there, there are a lot of different things within this, but some of the, the categories here are nitrogen fertilizer management. So smart uh, fertilizer application uh, that, that reduces nitrous oxide emissions, uh, increased soil organic content. Uh, so we're sequestering CO2 to a greater extent in our, in our soils. Uh, and increase agricultural productivity and the yield we get from, from those. Um, Cornelia, do you want to mention anything with respect to, to this son? I think you, I mean, you covered all the broad uh, aspects. Um, I would say that the one thing I just reinforced what you've been talking about is that 
the difference in your baseline, what would have happened, and the project scenario, that's what will generate your offset. So the offset is a tool to change people's behavior. So the question is, is what is that difference? And that's, what's, that's what quantifies the offset. So as you're looking at pieces of land and you're looking at opportunities, keep that in mind. It's not just what is the current carbon stock, but what really will be that difference to help you determine whether the project will be uh, economically viable. That's all right. Thank you. And, and the only other thing is that um, you can also blend projects together, so it doesn't have to just be an improved forest management or just an avoided conversion project. If you have an area where you were going to harvest and you're going to be cutting those trees down and replanting, and now you're going to protect those areas, that kind of falls under that area of improved forest management with the conservation. If you had planned for road building in there, or you were potentially going to create some, there's going to be some loss of forest, those can be combined, and so you also get larger bumps in those project types as well. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so um, I want to leave you with, uh, and, and, and remind you of those two I think important components, and hopefully we've we've uh, we've built out the 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 argument for that. Um, the mitigation that is required for Canada to meet its Paris Agreement targets, BC to meet its uh, climate goals, is very significant and will come at a very high cost if it's simply uh, targeted towards industrial emitters. Offsets are going to be a an absolutely critical tool. Uh, to use to achieve low cost compliance and therefore do more. And that's what we need to use offsets for. We need it to increase climate ambition because it allows us to achieve more at a lower cost. And the natural climate solutions of which you see a, a just a breadth of different types of projects can, I would argue, do that most effectively. Uh, simply because they are uh, sequestering CO2 and can do so on a very large scale as we've seen. But they're also uh, creating incredibly significant co-benefits in biodiversity protection, watershed protection, First Nations reconciliation, uh, and, uh, and, and we really need to be capitalizing on that opportunity. Well, uh, I think you certainly do have projects where you're combining uh, the values of carbon sequestration and using that market opportunity to fund uh, restoration uh, and, and better forest management practices, that is absolutely the case. Uh, and, and so, but, but in those projects, those other ecosystem benefits are going undervalued or, or not valued at all in, the, in most cases. And that's where we're seeing, we're finally seeing some action in the US with mitigation banking uh, you do see uh, some valuation of that. You do see it as a premium to the actual carbon if you have these other benefits. But I think specifically to your question, one of the exciting developments is uh, federally uh, there is a, there's a mechanism for biodiversity offsets on their species at risk, uh, on the Species at Risk Act. Very informal, very difficult to know what you can do and can't do. But uh, there is a lot of work being put into uh, making that more of a workable solution. And Environment Canada itself is recognizing the ability to generate carbon offsets and at the same time generate biodiversity offsets, conservation offsets, which would enhance the value of these types of projects for things like uh, protecting salmon habitat. <laughs>